Okay, today we're going to talk about the Ohmplung reaction. Or actually, Ohmplung is really a, a broad term. What it, what it means is it means reverse polarity. So it's using things that are normally thought of as electrophiles and using them as nucleophiles, or using things that are normally nucleophiles as electrophiles. I just like the reaction because it's fun to say. Oompalum. So, One reaction that you might remember is taking an aldehyde and treating it with potassium cyanide and acetic acid. That gives A cyanohydrin. Now, we can change this into an oomblong type reaction, one that's called the benzoin reaction. If we make a simple substitution. that instead of acetic acid, we use ethanol. It makes a huge difference. If that or that is used having to do with their PKAs. Ethanol has a PKA roughly around 15. Acetic acid has a PKA roughly around 5. reason that makes a difference has to do in the mechanism. So in both reactions, we start off with a cyanide attacking. Followed by protonation. Now, if we have acetic acid present, then acetic acid protonates. But if we have ethanol present, the ethanol protonates. Now here's the difference between the two reactions, cyanohydrin formation and the, the benzoin condensation. Once you deprotonate this, a strong base is formed. Conjugate pKa roughly around 15. This base is strong enough to deprotonate the OH and that just sends the reaction backwards. It's also strong enough to deprotonate this hydrogen right here.
The reason that that alkoxide can pull off that hydrogen is because you get that carbanion that's resonance stabilized. by the nitrile. See the nitrile is an electron withdrawing group. By putting that electron withdrawing group adjacent to that, that hydrogen, that increases that hydrogen's acidity, allowing that to be made. Now normally I insist on having you draw the major resonance structure of resonance stabilized carbanion. When it comes to Umpalung reactions, you're more than welcome just to draw the minor resonance structure. This right here is the major resonance structure, the minor resonance structure, mainly because there are some Umpalung reactions where it's very confusing to see how you go from the major resonance structure to the product. And I'll give an example of that later on. But it's pretty straightforward to see here. This carbanion this is your nucleophile. And that attacks the aldehyde. Assuming this product. Now, you could use the major resonance structure to get to here. In that case, what you would do is you would draw the electrons. These electrons go here, kicks those electrons up, and you get the same result. But this is much harder to see than, in this case, the minor resonance structure doing this. Next comes an internal proton transfer. Normally you don't do internal proton transfers, but in this case you can, because you can form a five-membered ring, an intramolecular five-membered transition state, and those are quite quick to form. And all that's left to do is kick off the nitrile. And we have the product. Now the benzoin reaction is actually named because this molecule right here, its name is Benzoin. This is what's known as an umpalung reaction. So, real quickly, I want to specify that this is the mechanism. The next that I'm going to draw 
is not the mechanism. But this is the way and the reason why it's considered to be an ohm Pullen reaction. Essentially, what you're doing in this reaction is you're taking this proton off first, which is never acidic in this case. But you're taking this proton off. And you're putting a carbanion on that carbon. And that carbanion is acting as the nucleophile. To hear that. What makes it an oomplong reaction is the carbonyl carbon is electrophilic. In an oomplong reaction, the carbonyl carbon is nucleophilic. And I'm going to put this molecule in quotes. This is not the actual molecule that does the attack. The actual molecule, of course, is this. But that's where the name comes from. Is you're using essentially what's supposed to be an electrophilic carbon, and you're changing it into a nucleophilic carbon, though temporarily. That's what's known as omplon. Now, potassium cyanide and ethanol. It has limitations. First limitation is The aldehyde that's used as starting material cannot have an enolizable hydrogen. If it does, side reactions tend to dominate. What I mean by side reactions, you get some aldol condensations. Um, those are the main side reactions, but you don't get the ohmplum. So you have that cannot have an enolizable hydrogen. Number two. Only pseudosymmetrical two hydroxy carbonyls can be formed this way. What I mean by that, the products
have to be like this, where r is equal to r prime. This cannot be cleanly made. The reason why is all these steps right here are reversible. And if you were to break down that mo molecule, And here is the Umplung breakdown. We covered this uh, at the end of lecture on Friday. But what we do is we break the 1 2 bond Carbon one gets a hydrogen. That's the hydrogen that we all want to pull off in the course of the mechanism. Carbon two becomes a carbonyl. And so if we want to make this product right here, this must be the nucleophile, and this must be the electrophile. But if you simply mix those together, there's no way of controlling which one's the nucleophile, which one's the electrophile. So if this is the nucleophile and this is the electrophile, you get this product. But this can act as a nucleophile and that can act as the electrophile. in which case you get this product. But since this can act as both nucleophile and electrophile, you get this product. And this one can act as both nucleophile and electrophile. So you get that product. And so, in short, you get a mess. Okay. So, let's address how to go about these two limitations. And to be completely honest with you, 
there is no reason whatsoever to ever use potassium cyanide and ethanol in an oomphalum reaction. There are much better ways of doing it. So, first thing let's address is cases where aldehydes have an enolizable hydrogen. Then a specialized catalyst called a thiazolium catalyst. Must be used. So here's some examples of a thiazolium. So there's this molecule right here. This molecule is thiamine. You might have heard of thiamine. It's on back of a lot of nutritional labels. Um, but this is essentially vitamin B1. Nature uses it. Um, it's found in the Krebs cycle. Specifically, the enzyme that's used, it's used in is pyruvate dehydrogenase. Synthetically speaking, organic synthesis, the thiazolium that's commonly used is this one. So, now these structures are kind of awfully difficult to remember. So, for a thiazolium catalyst that I'm going to generally use is I'm just going to use the important bits of the thiazolium catalyst. And this is what we are going to use as a thiazolium. Synthetically speaking, what's used is either this one, nature uses thiamine, so on and so forth. And what makes these so special is this hydrogen right here, turns out it's acidic. It has a pKa roughly around 17. meaning you can pull it off. With a base as weak as triethylamine. get this carbanion right here. Now we're not going to go too much into um, this carbanion, but what stabilizes it is the inductive effect through the nitrogen and it's also attached to a carbon attached to a sulfur. When it's attached to a carbon attached to a sulfur that creates some unusual stabilization of carbanions that's unique to sulfur and no other element. But you can also think of this as partially resonance stabilized.
At least the charge is, anyways. And this molecule right here is often referred to as a heterocyclic carbene. And there are some reactions that they sometimes use in Chem 344 that use heterocyclic carbenes. And that's essentially what they're using is this molecule here where this carbene, it's known as a carbene because it's a carbon that acts as a carbanion and as a carbocation, acts as a carbocation because there's an empty p orbital from a carbon. It's heterocyclic because it's part of a ring and has non-carbons in that ring. But we're going to be focusing mainly on this resonance structure right here. So, how it works. You have your thiazolium catalyst, an aldehyde, and triethylamine. And you can get a 2-hydroxycarbonyl. First step is an acid-base reaction. Then once you have your catalyst, that attacks the carbonyl. followed by a proton transfer. Now this hydrogen right here is now acidic because the electron withdrawing nature of this iminium species. And I'm just going to draw the minor resonance structure. The major resonance structure looks like this. So you can kind of see how, how much more stable this carbanion is than this carbanion by looking at and comparing the two major resonance structures. This has an N minus resin stabilized versus here in the major resonance structure 
you have a non-ionic compound. And so the highly acidic nature of this hydrogen is what stops other side reactions from, from occurring. And now this acts as a nucleophile. And it's really good to use the use the minor resonance structure because there's an additional resonance structure right here in addition to the major one. Because if we look, this has an enol in it. And you might be tempted to use that enol. But this resonance structure right here is the important resonance structure that's going to be used in the reaction, even though it's a minor resonance structure. So that's the one that's going to lead to the product. So you have that. Attack a carbonyl. And then you have Oh, I'm missing a propyl group. And then you have pretty much the same intermediate as before, or similar one. One, two, three, four, five. You can do this intramolecular proton transfer. followed by the you know, swings down, kicks off the thiazolium catalyst, giving you this product. And regenerate your thiazolium catalyst, and the reaction repeats itself. Now, this reaction, you need to use the thiazolium when your aldehyde has an enolizable hydrogen. Thing is, you can use the thiazolium catalyst when your aldehyde doesn't have an enolizable hydrogen. There really isn't a reason to use dancing cyanide and ethanol for an umplung reaction. Except maybe that it's cheaper. I only used it to remind you of the cyanohydrin formation and to put it in context because that was historically one of the first umplung reactions. 
Any time that you could use casein and ethanol, you can use thiazolium. Thiazolium. Just to repeat myself, thiazolium also works. when there's not an analyzable hydrogen. And real quickly, just to remind you what an analyzable hydrogen is. The blue hydrogen is the analyzable hydrogen. It's on the carbon adjacent to the carbonyl. The red hydrogen is the one that's not acidic. This is the hydrogen that is eventually, eventually pulled off in an open reaction. Now, the th thiazolium does still have the limitation that only pseudosymmetrical Two hydroxycarbonyls can be formed. To make non symmetrical. Two hydroxycarbonyls. Dithiane chemistry is used. What I mean by dithiane chemistry, dithiane is basically is a sulfur version of an acetal. And they can come in many shapes, but typically the dithiane that's synthetically used are cyclic dithionines that consist of five or six member drinks. Now, sulfur has a very unusual property that it makes, it can stabilize adjacent carbanions. This hydrogen right here has a pK roughly around 30.
this one, its pK is greater than 40. And it's two oxygen. And so this property is unique to sulfur. And has to do with the energy levels of the of the carbon sulfur antibonding orbital. They just happen to be right at the right location. So I'm not going to get into specifics of that. But suffice it to say, this hydrogen right here is unusually acidic. So the common way of using a dithione is you take an aldehyde. In fact, let's back up just a little bit and let's draw a 2-hydroxycarbonyl that we want to make. First thing we do is we break it down. Carbon 1. We break the 1-2 bond. Carbon 1 gets a hydrogen. Carbon 2 becomes a carbonyl. Then you figure out which one's going to be the nucleophile. Well, whichever one gets the hydrogen, that's going to be the nucleophile. Whichever one has carbon 1. This over here is the electrophile. Now, thiazoleum can't distinguish the two. But you can distinguish and designate this molecule right here to be the nucleophile by using dithiane chemistry. What you do is you start out with that molecule. And in the presence of acid, you add a dithiol to it. I'm not going to go over this mechanism. Because this mechanism is just acetal formation. Except instead of oxygens, you have sulfurs. And what you've done is made this hydrogen unusually acidic. And that you can deprotonate it by using butyl lithium. And all this is is just an acid-base reaction. All that's happening is your butyl lithium grabs that hydrogen, those electrons go there, get butane out and you get this carbanion and this carbanion is simply that. Now this is essentially just an organolithium and with the organolithium you can add in your electrophile, your carbonyl. followed by H3O+. And let me draw that a little bit bigger. There we go. Now all that's left to do is to replace the sulfurs with a carbonyl.
Now, replacing the sulfurs with the carbonyl, that's not an easy thing to do. Those sulfurs are pretty, hang on, they're pretty tight. And so there are countless ways of trying to do it. When you have so many ways of trying to do it, that means no one way really works that well. So the most widely used way of doing this is by using a specialized Lewis acid, mercury chloride, and water. Just because mercury has a tendency to form strong bonds to sulfur and it helps rip it off. Like so. Now, the mechanism of this We haven't used that many Lewis acid reactions. So let's go ahead and do the mechanism of this. Think of mercury Cl2 as just a mercury dication, Lewis acid. That has an affinity for forming bonds with sulfur. So what you do is it's a very similar mechanism to acetyl cleavage, except instead of using uh, H plus to activate things, we're going to use mercury 2 plus as just a gigantic proton. Then you use the lone pair from the sulfur to swing down and kick off the activated sulfur. Then water attacks. followed by proton transfer. And then use the mercury to activate the other sulfur. and use the lone pair from the oxygen to kick that off. Followed by a deep rotation. going to go a little bit long. Actually, I won't. We'll pick this up on Wednesday.